Castlevania on vinyl, Mondo. Mondo. Let's tackle this package. Tack this pack. Normally, I do a bit of research before buying physical media from an unfamiliar source. I've been burned too many times by cheapo companies out there for sloppy scent, so I'm definitely approaching this as a music fan and vinyl enthusiast. My love for Castlevania sparked my interest, of course, but I'm more interested in the quality of the pressing. When it comes to this thing, there are very few reviews that cover the quality of the audio. Most seem more interested in the collectible aspect. I mean, I get it. This is a niche item, kitschy. Hey, these would look great next to my Funko Pops and other weird toys, at least that's the impression I got from the majority of folks who wrote about this online. Make no mistake, this is their target demographic, the trinkets and status symbol crowd. Ingested by species across the marine world. Recycling, what a waste. These are stacked two or three deep right now. Craptastic plastic pals, cheaply made statues of your favorite characters with next to no creativity or individualism in their design. Mondo Tees. Uh, people don't appreciate their trash. Does this artwork suit the original Castlevania? I'm almost offended by it. What's with the prebubescent crustache? Again, Mondo know their audience. Part of the reason I prefer the classic Castlevania series is in the art design. Barbaric 80s action imagery. You can practically smell the sweat on the back of Belmont's muscular neck beneath that bouncy, bountiful mullet. Bouncy, bountiful mullet. It's a trash, isn't it's it? It's a sweet, sweet trash. My cup, my cup, it's blood. My cup, my cup. Yeah. I'm partial to Ruggedvania, the jagged Castlevania lettering all day over the soft sea alternative. What in the hell are we even looking at here? Did they even have a theme, or was this just outsourced to AI? I'll give Becky Cloonan credit. The background details are phenomenal. That bright face in the foreground, though, it's so cheesy. Dracula or Alucard? It's well drawn, I suppose, but doesn't necessarily evoke mid-80s Vania to me. Look at Death's grisly, disturbing mug illustrated right next to it. Now that's pretty awesome. Awesome. I wish it wasn't relegated to the background with all of these other well-drawn images. Mound of skeletons, the smattering of bats, and wolf. Welcome to my drawing. Do you enjoy my drawing? Enter at your own risk. If you think it's scary on the outside, wait till you see the basement. Neck beards, milk moustaches, and wool. I didn't mean to call you a meatloaf, Jack! Lots of wolf to celebrate and say your prayers. Look at these rad symbols drawn to represent the bosses. I'd wear this bat on a shirt or the Medusa Doodle. Monster Frankfurter looks like a super pissed misfits punk rocker from the early 80s. A real hate breeder. I'm so down. Grim Reaper with a wicked scythe. A mummy mouthing off. And look at this in the corner, a legend to explain what things mean, though none of these are keyed out on the map. What kind of cheeses me off is how the credits are laid out, or should I say the lack of them altogether. The music is ascribed to the Kokia Club, which is fine, and I know I'm mispronouncing that. The umbrella many Konami composers exist under, but I wish there was a bit more transparent love given to Kanuyo Yamashita and Satoi Tarashima. Maybe break the pieces down, exhibit who wrote what. These Japanese video game composers have been getting the shaft for years. Any info would have been nice. This is the entire package. As I mentioned in the NES Castlevania Rank and Review video, this was Yamashita's first professional gig. It's astounding. Imagine blowing the barn doors off on your debut, but not seeing your real name in the credits. Look, I understand that things were different back then. At the very least, she was tastefully given the James Banana pseudonym, which harkens back to the great James Bernard, the composer for quite a few Hammer horror flicks, including Terence Fisher's Dracula starring Christopher Lee. Prologue. The iconic opening track by Yamashita breaks into Terashima's vampire killer. Need I say more? Everyone knows the score. The staccato-like leads get me pumped every time. It builds into a grandiose first chapter blood-pumping piece that is impossible not to groove to. Satori Terashima continues with the moody second stage Scorcher Stalker, a precarious, delicate track that perfectly suits the unstable environment. Insta kill death pits everywhere, flying Medusa domes. It all pairs so well with the choppy bass rhythm and dynamic melodica or pipe organ approximations that lead the harmony. <laughs> Brilliant. 
Yamashita returns with my personal favorite 8-bit track ever on any device. Wicked Child, a danceable disco with a funky underbelly. It's almost impossible to describe this tune. It hasn't been recreated a billion times like Bloody Tears, but I think that speaks to how perfect this original is. I'm as big a fan of video game cover songs as anyone, but no one has ever been able to replicate the bouncy nature of this piece. One guy who gets mighty close on an EWI. He definitely has the feel down. She continues with the hauntingly groovy walking on the edge. Man, I love playing this thing on the guitar and keyboard. Banging out that intro before it sheds its skin right into that propulsive swinging rhythm. I'm a sucker for classic 8-bit tunes that kick off with a unique riff that is never revisited. Stalker returns as we arise from the abyss. Heart of Fire is Bloody Tears before Simon's Quest. That breakdown... bit Castlevania sequels owe something to this. From Simon's Quest to Belmont's Revenge, these repeated motifs, yeah, they started here, baby. Out of Time is an upbeat, choppy little number by Terashima that really ramps up the anxiety as we encroach on Dracula's throne room. A nifty little ditty that sticks to a higher register. Maybe not my favorite thing to listen to on its own, but it suits the game perfectly. Overall, the production is decent. It's certainly listenable, but none of the stage themes blew my socks off. Oddly, the boss tracks sound a lot more lush. They're definitely the highlight here. Poison Mind is the real standout as it relies less on delicate little sprinklings of bass and trouble. It's satisfying because the entire track is a full bodied wall of sound, something that translates to the format. Black Knight is almost as good, and I dig the way it goes out with the addition of in-game sound effects. Overall, my expectations were too high for this $20 product. They've clearly tweaked a thing or two, but something always gets a little lost when attempting to fool around with mono tracks. The bass is punchy, but there's a weird echo to the beefier bits, and the treble is entirely too tinny for me. Again, this is really gonna boil down to taste. I'd say if you're spinning this on low-end analog gear or a USB turntable, it's probably going to sound fine. Or if you're just happy to enjoy the novelty of the experience, but I still don't see the point forking out the extra cash if you're into it for the music, as it still sounds like a digital transfer. Find a place to purchase it, save the files to your phone or an external hard drive unless you absolutely need the physical packaging to display. Some companies don't care or lack the means to clean things up properly. The cost to do so is outrageously high. Perhaps, if we look at it less cynically, this could be a case where the originals simply don't exist, and this was legitimately the best they could do. I really don't know, but to expect this to melt your mind with a good set of speakers or headphones might leave you disappointed. Next time on this channel, I, I don't know, how about some more Castlevania? <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs>